in your name, amen. Tyler, thank you for that, and I encourage you all to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 55 as we look at what God has for us this morning. As you're turning there, I want to just draw your attention to something that you may have seen in your bulletin, and so this is a new article here for July, and this was something that I wrote to someone who was very new in the faith, and I thought it might be of help to you. So it's called, Dear uh, New Sibling, Brother, Sister, In Christ, Things Young, and All Christians Need to Remember. And we put them like this rather than just giving you an 8.5 by 11 so that you can just stick it in your Bible. If you have a a, a usual size Bible, you can just stick it in there and that might be something that you can refer to because there's a lot of hurt and a lot of issues that are going on in this broken world and sometimes we just really need some encouragement and just some reminders and hopefully that will be what this is for you. And I'd also like to um, just introduce someone, and I'm going to embarrass three, um, three ladies here this morning, but uh, one, we go way back. In fact, the first time that I met Kasaya was uh, back in, I think it was in July of 2004, and she was six months old, and I'm just really thankful. So uh, Kasaya, just, hi, there's Kasaya, <laughs> and Alicia, nice meeting you, and, uh, and Joe San. I'm really thankful that you can be here. So I met Kasai in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, She is the granddaughter of Roddy Taylor, who's preached here in this pulpit. I think it was back in 2012 or 2013. And Roddy and I call each other, we're brothers from another mother. And that's just the way it is. And Roddy is a dear brother, and it's just wonderful to have you all here with us this morning, working um, in Aurora Children's Home. I'm really grateful that uh, God could bring you here. Just welcome them this morning. So, let's get to the Word. Why don't we stand as we honor His Word? This is 23 verses, so if you're able to stand for 23 verses, please do. If not, we understand. Just be upright in heart and pay attention to what God is saying in His Word. To the choir master with stringed instruments, a mascal of David. Verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble on me and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove and I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away and I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within the house of, uh, within God's house. We walked in the throng. Let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and He hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, He who is enthroned from old, because they do not change and do not fear God. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, I will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You may be seated. 
So our fighter verse this morning, you may see at the bottom of your notes, is this one from Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. That might be a verse that some of you know. If you've been in church world, that might be a verse that some of you know very well. And that word cast, it's not about fishing, but there's, a, there's an aspect of it. But cast means to flee, to, to set aside in a, in a hurried manner. And there is a burden that is there because sometimes those burdens keep us from moving. The, the, the short amount of time, those five years that I lived on a farm and my, my dad was plowing stuff and, you know, he, you'd have to go out in front and if there was something that was keeping that ground from being tilled up, you'd have to go out in front and you wouldn't just set that obstacle that was in the path off to the side. You would make sure that you would chuck it as far away as you possibly could. And that's what God's calling us to do is that we all have burdens that we face. And I know as we've been going through the Psalms, one of the things that may come about of this is that this, this sounds very familiar, right? There's a temptation to think, okay, here we go again with another Psalm that's talking about, Lord, I'm in a bad way. Please help me. Please help me. Please help me. And sometimes you may te be tempted to think, well, how much more can we say on a matter? And how much more and how much different ways can we say to God, please help me? I'm in trouble. Please help me. My enemies are coming against me. I need some variety. Well, I think this psalm gives you some variety. If you look at verses 12 to 14 that we just read, you see the pain that's here that's a special kind of pain. Because we would expect pain to come about from people that are against us and, and don't believe what we believe. But when the pain comes from someone that's close to us, you may remember when you were um, when you were in high school or when you were in college and your boyfriend or your girlfriend broke up with you and you didn't see it coming. Or you may feel like, you know, that you raised your children in a certain way and then all of a sudden they decide to go. Or you uh, have taken counsel with someone, as the scriptures talk about, and you opened yourself up to them. You were, you were vulnerable. You, you let them know all of the hurts and all of the issues and all of your past and they began to use that against you. Now, there's pain, and then there's that type of pain. And all of us have been through it. Well, I say that. If you haven't been through it, just wait. There's nothing like a pain that comes from friends, family, or even the family of God. I, I joke around, and I say there's no hurt like church hurt. But if you've been in the office with me any amount of time, what, I, what will I tell you? Most jokes are half true. There's no pain like a pain of when you've allowed yourself in and you've brought someone else in and they hurt you. So you look at this in Psalm 55, 12 to 14, for it is not an enemy who taunts me that I could bear it, right? Because you expect it. You expect to be hurt by someone who's against you. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you. A man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, we used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. And then he goes into talking about him as if he were an enemy. But there is a pain that's there. And I, and I want you to know this. And that's just why I like going through the scriptures piece by piece and bit by bit. Because I may have been tempted to skip over something like this in order to go to something else. But this is something, the Bible is very honest about what's going on in our lives. God knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what's going on. And so this is the first thing that I want to tell you. Um, it's not going to come up on the screen, so we're just going to talk about it. Is The first thing is to be honest with God about what's happening. Be honest with Him. Now, the reason we can be honest with Him is that he already knows what's going on with you. One of the hard things about being a parent is you see your children hurting and you know them well enough to know in what angle kind of they're hurting, but unless they tell you, you don't know what's going on. And that's really hard to be able to try to help in a way that you don't know where they need help. And so sometimes you end up just standing back and, and watching. How are you doing? Are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm fine. See, they learn early. 
That's not something you necessarily teach. They'll tell you, oh, I'm fine. And really what they want to do is be alone. And sometimes what they want to do is try to fix it themselves. Or they don't want to bother. We sometimes see that with prayer requests, right? You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's much easier to pray and, and offer a prayer request when it's someone else. And even when we're offering a prayer request, it's usually for a physical issue. But it's really hard to offer a prayer request and to ask someone to pray for you, pray for you when, you're in, when it's a weakness and it's a struggle and, you know, this person did this to me or, or I'm struggling with my thought life in this way. And It's really hard to be able to be honest with that with someone else. And sometimes I think we project that upon God, you know, because we either don't want to be a bother to someone or when we're talking this way, or we're thinking, well, other people have worse things going on than, than I do, and so I'm just going to have to suck it up, buttercup, and just keep moving on. And in reality, that is the exact wrong thing to do. Because all of us may have grown up with a certain way of how you share your feelings. And you can tell, when you start sharing feelings with someone, they'll, they'll find a way to cut it off. When I'm talking, certain times I'm talking with someone, and they're like, yeah, well, I'm sure you'll be okay. Or sometimes they put a little bit of Jesus in it. Well, God's got it. You know, don't worry about it. But what they're doing is they're cutting you off. You don't have to do that with God. You can tell him anything. And you can tell him everything. He already knows it. He's not a father like I am who is guessing about what's going on with their children. He already knows it. Well, I can't tell him that. Well, you better start because otherwise there's going to be this building up and building up. So, I mean, so you're reading through verses 1 to 8. And yes, these are the same things that we've heard in many of the other Psalms. But it's a reminder that we can be honest with him. Give ear to my prayer, O God, verse 1. Hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I'm restless in my complaint and I moan. Now, we don't like to admit that to other people. I got a problem. Well, some people don't mind it, but, but there's others that really struggle with letting people know that they've got an issue that's going on. But either way, we can tell it to God. Because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, they drop trouble on me in anger. They, they bear a grudge against me. Boy, those grudges, they're subtle, but they're effective, aren't they? Sometimes those, you can hold on to those grudges for a long, long time. And in verses 4 to 8, look at, look at what's going on with his heart and mind. Anguish, terrors of death, fear and trembling, horror overwhelms me. That's honest, isn't it? Boy, some of us, we don't want to be that honest. We want to keep our prayers general. He wants us to be specific. He wants us to be as specific as we can possibly be. He wants to just run away. You ever just want to run away from your problems? You know, that's a lot of reason why people move to Colorado, why they move to Denver. Denver is an escape. Denver is the most isolated metropolitan city in the United States. And people want to go to a place that has a little bit of life to it, has a little bit of, uh, of civilization to it, but is, is removed. And then if they don't like that, they can just go to the mountains. And there's all sorts of territory there to be able to get away and find yourself and collect yourself it's tough it, it, it really is tough but you know what you can get away from mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and and your old town and your old high school and your old this and your old that you can get away from everybody else you know who you can't get away from two people you can't get away from yourself and who do you think sunday school answer insert here who do you think you can't else you can't get away from one of the, the Bible readings for this morning is, where if, I, if I were to go to the, to the heights, you're there. If I were to go to the depths, you're there. If I were to go wide and far, you're there. You're there, you're there, you're there. And so you might as well just stop and breathe and start dealing with the one who made you and wired you. It's always good to go back to the maker on anything along that line. And so the, the honesty that's there, just, just be honest with God. Don't, don't try to hold it in. He is really good about that. Now, what's the background of this? Because most of these Psalms aren't written in a vacuum. There's usually something going on that's prompting this hurt and prompting this harm. Well, 
From 2 Samuel 12 to 2 Samuel 16, we see that there is this event that's going on. And the main player that David here is talking about is a gentleman by the name of Ahithophel. Gazunhite, right? But his name is Ahithophel. And Ahithophel was the main counselor to King David. And when, when things were starting to turn south for David because of his sin with Bathsheba, in 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12, I'll just read this to you. It says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. That doesn't sound good. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Oh, and by the way, sometimes when people may come along and say, well, the Bible says it's okay for us to, I shouldn't put it in that voice. Well, the Bible says that it's okay for us to marry other, because, you know, David did it and people did it like that. You've noticed that every time it's mentioned that there's more than one wife to a man, um, it, it doesn't ever turn out good. Think of Abraham with Sarah and Hagar. I mean, I'll just go down the list. Solomon? How he kept up, I have no idea. 700 wives and 300 concubines. So this is not being prescriptive. It's prescribing. It's descriptive. It didn't go well for him. But verse 12, for you, what you did in secret, I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Now, what's, so what's happening here? Well, so David has this son named Absalom. And one of the things that we find out about David and Absalom's relationship was this. There is a verse in the Bible that, said, that says that David never asked Absalom, why did you do this? Never corrected him. Never disciplined him. He just let Absalom do what Absalom was going to do. Now we think, well, isn't that very loving? You don't want to squelch the creativity of your child and all that. Well, I think Scripture is right. Fathers discipline the children that they love. The Lord disciplines the children he loves. Read that in, in, in Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. I didn't make that up. God is telling us that when parents discipline their children in a loving way, when they discipline their children, it's because they love them and they care about them and they're setting up boundaries for them. And when they don't do that, well, then everything just goes. And then what happens is 10, 20 years later, the children come back to the parents and are resentful. Why didn't you tell me that this was the wrong way to go? It's hard in the beginning, but it will help them and be blessing them later on in life. But Absalom decided, you know what? I want to be king. David was already king. The son wanted to be king. And so they started, and there was this division that was going on. Ahithophel, don't forget about him, was the counselor to David, but then he decided he was going to jump ship and be counselor to Absalom. It looked like Absalom was going to be the one that was going to get the momentum, and Ahithophel wanted to be on the right side. Now, Ahithophel, sweet counsel together, right? Knew lots of things about David, knew lots of things personally about David, and so he ended up using that against David for Absalom, and so David just decided that he was going to take off for a bit, and he was going to come up with a plan. And the plan ended up being where he ended up having another council that was going to go and be planted into the inner circle of Absalom's council. And what ends up happening is they end up having two types of council that were kind of knocking up against each other. And Absalom began to listen to the other council rather than Ahithophel. And Ahithophel ended up hanging himself. But in the meantime, one of the things that we see in 2 Samuel 16, it says, Now in those days the counsel of Ahithophel gave was as if one counseled the word of God. As if one consulted, rather, the word of God. Now in those days the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. Because Ahithophel was normally right. Correct. He was pursuing the things of God. And God blessed that. And then he turns on David. And so what we're seeing here is the fruit of that hurt, the fruit of that grief. And David's just laying it out before God, and it's preserved in Scripture, so he's laying it out before us so that we can, can realize that it's okay for us to, to share that hurt, to share that grief, to share that sadness that we're dealing with before the things of God. We also have to realize a couple of things too. Look at verses 9 to 11, destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence in the, and strife in the city. 
Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it, and it's ruin it's in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. Anytime you do something, you think, well, it's just me doing it. No, it always has an effect on those around you. You see here, destroy and divide their tongues, for I see violence, not just in their heart. That's what you might expect to say. But in the city, in the walls, in the marketplace. At my previous church, there was this lady that, I was going to say she's with the Lord. I I hope she is. Um, There wasn't a lot of fruit that was there. But she was always very vocal about what she wanted to have done. She felt like it was her constitutional right to be able to say whatever was on her mind, no matter what it was about and no matter who it hurt. And so, but when I would preach, there were certain doctrines that she would like for me to preach. And I would look back at her, and I've, I've shared this with you before probably, but I, I would look back at her, and if I'm preaching on that doctrine, she'd be looking at me and smiling. If I would go to anything else, she would be sitting back there like, oh, really? I mean, just really, just over the top. Just over the top. Oh. But then I would get back on it. Oh. And then... And it was, it, was, it was beautiful, and it was really a confidence booster for someone who had never been in full-time pastoral, lead pastoral ministry. That was tough. That was really tough, and I began to realize that I can't look at her anymore. <laughs> I really can't look her way. But it was a smaller church. It's hard to avoid. But th- the thing is, is that we've got to realize what our actions do in planting seeds of discord with other people. We may think like we're venting and, and, and just sharing our hearts, as we say in the Christian world. I just want to share my heart, and it's usually a, usually a zinger. But what it does is, you may be having a problem with something personally, whether it's church or otherwise, and then you share it. And someone else who's just minding their own business and just whistling a happy tune, then all of a sudden, they start thinking about it, and you're like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And then they start getting all whatever. And then they share it and they share it and they share it. It's very contagious. And that's what's being said here. Lord, divide their tongues. Don't don't make them unified. Spread them out because what's happening now is they're so unified and they're discontent and, 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 and walking away from the things of God. They're so divided. They're, they're so united that it was starting to tear the city apart. Now, if you don't know the story, because I jumped in on 12 to 14, again, verses 1 to 11 sound like a lot of the other Psalms. And then when you realize that what's happening is not from an enemy, it's from a friend. Well, then you, again, you begin to realize the heart of it. Go to verse 20. Look at how they're using their tongues. My companion stretched out his hand against his friend. He violated his covenant. Listen to this. His, His speech was smooth as butter. Yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. We got to be careful paying attention to what people are saying. And we got to we got to watch. And we got to learn look and 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 really really listen because over time people will show things. I mean just look we had a presidential debate. It's a reminder that these folks want your vote. I, I hope they care about you, but I don't know because there's been things that have happened in the past over the years of our presidencies. But they want your vote, and they're going to tell you what they think you want to hear to get your vote. They're going to tell the churches and the Christians what they think you want to hear so they'll get your vote. And, and whoever, the, whoever the constituency is, you know how you can tell? Over time. Boy, they really sounded good at that debate. Boy, they really sounded good at that nomination, whatever. They sure sounded good at the inaugural address. But just watch what they do, and then you'll see. We have to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. We are not the ones that are going to cause the the grief and the issues, but we've got to be wise with those that are doing those things, right? So we've got to be real careful with that. And so when you look here, at verse, going down to verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord. Isn't it wonderful that there is a Lord that we can cast our burden to? Are you all with me? Okay, got a little cooler in here so the, ch- so the chattering of your teeth will keep you awake. That's the idea. That's all. But the idea is this. We've got to make sure that we recognize and we are praising God that there is a burden 
that there's a Lord that we can cast our burdens to. We don't have to bear it alone. We don't have to try to figure it out. We don't have to try and get on top of it. Yes, he wants us to, to maneuver through it, but not by ourselves. We're not equipped for that. We are equipped to go to him because he's the one that made it and he's the one that wired us. Whenever there's something going on at your home, or especially if you had, had someone build your home or had someone install something or, or make something, it's always good to go back to the maker. It's always good, and that's what's going on with us. We need to continue because we're image bearers of God. We need to constantly go back to our maker and say, Lord, what, what's going on? How, how am I going to be able to get through this? I know you'll do it because that's what you see in verses 16 to 19. But I call to God and the Lord, what? What does it say? But I call to God and the Lord will save me. I know you trust me. I know you trust me, but I need you to make sure that you have your Bibles open to where you can see what I'm dealing with here. The Lord will save me every morning and evening at noon. Every morning and evening and at noon. Now, that's pretty much all of the day. This is not just a little bit, but all of the day. He's dealing with this. I utter my complaint and moan. Same thing from what he said in verse 2. But here's the thing. He was asking God to hear him before. Now, as he's going through it and thinking about the person of God and the presence of God and his own personal experience about how God has dealt with this, he hears my voice. I know he's going to hear me. That's what Jesus did for us. When he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, he went to the Father 40 days later and he opened up heaven for us to where we could approach the throne of grace with confidence. He redeems my soul from the in safety from the battle that I wage. For many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God. Well, that's not going to be said of us, is it? We want to be sure that we are ones who are, I mean, it says they don't change. You know what another word for that is? They don't repent. And that's a word that we have to reclaim in the Church of America repentance we're, we're not born the way we should be born that's why jesus said we need to be born again and and we need to repent and we need to be daily repenters hourly repenters because something's going to come along in our thought life and our speech and our actions something's going to come along and it's going to be that zing and and the holy spirit's going to make you aware that this doesn't belong in you and then what do you do lord don't just say i'm sorry Repent. Because what sorry means is, I'm sorry I did that, I'm sorry that happened, I'm sorry I got caught. Repentance is, I'm going to go the opposite direction of wherever that sin was going to be taking me. And it happens to us all the time. We need to be sure we're aware of it. Now you're thinking, well, this is great, Old Testament, thousand years before Jesus. Can, can Jesus help us with this? Oh, absolutely. Not only does Jesus give us some principles, he went through it. Did Jesus not go through having a friend betray him? The answer would be yes. Jesus did go through a betrayal. Think about this. He had three, or he, he, for three years, he had 12 disciples that followed him, heard everything he taught, saw everything he did, saw not only how he taught those who were for him, but how he stood up to those who were against him. King of kings and Lord of lords chose to come in the flesh to identify with us and to take our sin and to redeem us from it. And what ends up happening? Well, if you remember as we were going through Mark, there was an issue where this young lady comes in and Jesus was with Lazarus, Lazarus and, um, and, and Bethany and all of the disciples. There were people that had been healed and there were other people that were looking on. And all of a sudden, there was this lady that comes in. And she begins to break this alabaster flask that was probably about, in our day, about $40,000 worth. And she begins to anoint Jesus. His head, feet, hands, begins to anoint him. There were some, and it identifies in John 12 as Judas, who said, why this waste? And that was the, cat, the, the final straw for Judas. He did not like how the king was doing things. 
just like Ahithophel did not like how the king was doing things. So Judas decides to go over to the other side, just like Ahithophel decided to go over to the other side. And soon there were issues that were going on. This parallel is, is incredible. And if you remember when they were talking about in Mark when they were doing the Lord's Supper and Jesus is saying, the Last Supper rather, and Jesus is saying, one of you will betray me. Do you know what most of the disciples said? Do you remember? Is it I? You see in Psalm 55, in verse 13, but it is you. Jesus would look at Judas and say, it is you. But Jesus, if there's ever been a time when we've disobeyed Jesus and dishonored Jesus, Jesus would look at us and say, it's you too. We're all betrayers. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We're all in, in, in needing a daily dose of repentance and forgiveness from our Lord. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows our lifestyle. He knows our thought life. He knows, it says, what we're going to say even before we say it. He knows what we're going to post on social media even before we post it. We come now, though, when all of that was taking place and Jesus was identified, Judas, who, by the way, Ahithophel, he hanged himself. Judas, he hanged himself. It is a terrible thing when it comes to a realization for you that you have sinned before a holy God, that you have betrayed a holy God. When you come to that point, and you may have bottomed out and you realize, what in the world am I going to do? How am I going to get past this? I would just encourage you, look to the cross. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross full well knowing that you were going to do what you were going to do and what you were going to say and what you were going to think. And he loves you enough to hate your sin, but he loves you enough to pay for that sin on the cross on your behalf. So you don't have to sit in it anymore. You can be redeemed from it. Real quick story. Some of you may remember back in January 15th, 2009, you may remember when um, Sullenberg, Captain Sullenberger had to land that plane in the Hudson. One of the things that he, when he, when he landed the plane, both of the gentlemen that were in the cockpit, both of them, actually were like, oh, okay, I think we're going to be able, I think the plane's okay. The next thing he wanted to do was make sure that all 155 souls on board, and I'm not sure if Don's in the room. Don, yeah, Don reminded us on Wednesday that that's what, that's what um, airplane pilots call the people that are on board, souls. So should we. But he wanted to make sure all 155 were present and accounted for. And it took him four hours to finally get that. And so when they had to go take all of the crew and everybody to the hospital to make sure that they were doing okay, and when Captain Sullenberger found out that all of those souls were accounted for, he said it was like the weight of the universe was just lifted off of him. And he said that he had never felt such relief in his life. I think when we think about our sins in our life, I think sometimes that's what we're thinking of. Boy, wouldn't it nice to be able to have that relief, to know that someone cared about me, but also that someone can take this off of me. As we observe the Lord's Supper, you're going to see some symbols of the fact that there is one who did just that for you. I'm going to ask our instrumentalists and our, um, our deacons, if they would, to make their way forward. And as they're making their way forward, I want to remind you that this Lord's Supper is not for everyone, but we want it to be for everyone at some point. What do I mean? The Bible makes it very clear that when we talk about approaching the Lord's Supper and approaching the table, that we are to do all we can to make sure that we are confessing those sins that are before us and repenting and turning from them. So, 
one of the things that God's called us to do is follow him in believer's baptism. And so if you're a follower of Jesus and you followed that initial piece of obedience and believer's baptism, then you are more than welcome to partake of the supper. But I will say this, if there is unrepentant sin in your life, that right now you have no intention of giving up, or if you have never trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, I encourage you to look, but according to what 1 Corinthians 11 says, please do not partake. Because this is for those who, have, who are willingly following all that Christ has for them. This is for those who, are, who have followed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because what these symbols represent is the body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, what's going to happen is, we're going to have our, our deacons are going to pass these out to you. So we've got two deacons here, two deacons here, and there will be one in the back that will handle that back row and handle the, uh, the, the balcony. And I'm going to, in just a few moments, I'm going to ask Rick, who is our chairman of the deacon, to come to pray over these elements. While all of these elements are being passed out, this is an opportunity for you to make sure that you are right with the Lord, that you have trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, that you have followed in believer's baptism, and if you realize, oh, I haven't done that, well, I'm going to do it. But also, if there's a, an area of your life where you're saying, boy, up until this point, I'm not giving it up. I'm not going to do this God's way. Then you see what he's done for you, and then you'll be like, instead of those white knuckles being there, it'll be an open hand. Please, Lord, receive me. Forgive me. I'm all in. I'm all yours.